the reproductive system functions to propagate the species, that is, to make more humans. It doesn't function until puberty. The primary sex organs are known as the gonads. They produce the gametes as well as secrete the sex hormones, which are steroid-based hormones. These hormones help support the reproductive structures as well as produce the secondary sex characteristics for each sex. There are accessory reproductive organs that are the various structures that allow for fertilization. Fertilization is when the male sperm unites with the female ovum. Also, the accessory reproductive organs house the developing fetus. This occurs only in the female system. We'll start by looking at the anatomy of the male reproductive system. The primary organ, or the gonad, is the testis. These are housed in the scrotum, and this is the site of sperm production as well as the production of testosterone, the male sex hormone. Sperm leave the body through a series of ducts. After the testes, it goes into the epididymis, then the ductus deferens, or the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and then out the urethra. The urethra serves in both the urinary system and the male reproductive system. The accessory sex glands add secretions during ejaculation. The seminal glands, the prostate, and the bulbourethral glands are the accessory sex glands in the male. The testes are housed outside the body in the scrotum. The epididymis is closely associated with the testes. Sperm are formed in the testes. They mature in the epididymis. And at ejaculation, they are sent through the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and out the urethra. Notice how the vas deferens enters the body. This is the ureter that it curls around as it enters the ejaculatory duct. The seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral glands add fluid to the semen. The scrotum is the skin and superficial fascia that's outside the abdominopelvic cavity. It contains the paired testes. Viable sperm cannot be produced at body temperatures, so the testes have to be outside the body to work properly. The testes are composed of 250 lobules, each containing 1 to 4 seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules are the site of spermatogenesis, or the production of sperm. The epididymis is housed with the testes. It's a series of tubes that are continuous with the seminiferous tubules. The epididymis is a little on the posterior side of the testes. This is where the sperm mature and they're housed until ejaculation. The spermatic cord is a connective tissue sheath. It houses not only the spermatic artery and veins, also the autonomic nerves and the vas deferens. Testicular cancer is relatively rare, 1 in 50,000 males, but it is the most common cancer in young men ages 15 to 35. Usually there is a history of mumps in puberty or early adulthood or orchitis, inflammation of the testicles. Cryptorchidism is the most important risk factor. Cryptorchidism is when the testes fail to descend just before or shortly after birth and they remain in the abdominal cavity instead. Just like females should do regular breast exams, males should do regular palpation of the testes. The most common sign of testicular cancer is a painless, solid mass in the scrotum. If detected early, the cure rate is impressive. 90% are cured by orchiectomy, that is, removal of the involved testis. There may or may not be radiation or chemotherapy associated with the surgery. Here we see the testis. Notice that there are the seminiferous tubules tightly coiled. They're going to feed into the epididymis. The epididymis will feed into the vas deferens. Now here's the spermatic cord. You can see the arteries and the veins. The yellow thing is the nerves, and there's the vas deferens. All of these are bundled by this connective tissue sheath, and as they enter the body, these all separate and go their respective ways. This is a cross-section through a seminiferous tubule. These are the cells that undergo meiosis to make the sperm, which you see here in the center. And then these cells outside the seminiferous tubules are the interstitial cells. These are the endocrine cells of the testes. These are the cells that produce testosterone. The penis is the copulatory organ for the male. It is what delivers sperm to the female reproductive tract. Along with the scrotum, this makes up the external genitalia of the male. 
The enlarged tip of the penis is known as the glans penis. It is covered by the prepuce or foreskin. This is frequently removed by circumcision. There is no particular reason to circumcise a male other than circumcision does seem to reduce the number of infections the male has. The shaft of the penis houses the urethra. The urethra is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. Also in the shaft are two corpora cavernosa. The corpora are the erectile tissue. When these engorge with blood, the penis becomes rigid. The testes, epididymis, vas deferens, I'll come around here. This is the urinary bladder. So here's the urethra coming from the urinary bladder through the prostate gland and through the center of the penis. The blue tissue are the corpora. Now notice when we look at the penis and cross section, the urethra is surrounded by the corpus spongiosum. This will engorge with blood, but it will also keep the urethra open, keep it from being collapsed. These are the two corpora cavernosa, they engorge with blood. This is what makes the penis rigid when it is erect. The epididymis stores the sperm for approximately 20 days. It is here that the sperm pick up some antimicrobial proteins known as defensins and they become motile. The vas deferens is the tube from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct. In a vasectomy, it's the vas deferens that is clipped as a form of birth control. With the vas deferens clipped, sperm can't get from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct. Each ejaculatory duct empties into the urethra. The seminal vesicles are one of the male accessory organs. They contribute to the semen. They produce an alkaline viscous fluid that contains fructose and citric acid. These are food sources for the sperm. Also some coagulating enzymes that allow the sperm to stick to the side of the vaginal walls, prostaglandins, and some substances that increase motility. It is the seminal vesicle fluid that fluoresces under UV light. The prostate is the accessory gland that encircles the urethra. The fluid it produces helps activate the sperm and it also accounts for about one-third of the quantity of the semen. This fluid is slightly acidic. It also contains citrate to act as a nutrient for the sperm, several enzymes, and prostate-specific antigen. Prostatitis is one of the disorders of the male reproductive system. This is an inflammatory disorder. Prostatitis is frequently caused by bacterial infections, usually the organism E. coli, which is part of the normal intestinal flora. These infections can be either acute, sudden in onset and quick to go away, or chronic, where they persist for some period of time. The treatment for prostatitis is antibiotics and drugs that offer pain relief. Chronic prostatitis, or pelvic pain syndrome, is the most common but least understood of the prostate disorders. There are two types. In the inflammatory type, the patient complains of urinary tract infection type symptoms. There are white blood cells present, but no bacteria can be found. In the non-inflammatory type, there are the same UTI symptoms, but no white blood cells or bacteria are found. This is treated primarily by treating the pain. Benign prostatic hypertrophy, or BHP, affects nearly every elderly male. The cause is unknown, but hormone changes related to age may be responsible. Because the prostate encircles the urethra, when the prostate swells, it blocks the urethra. This leads to urinary retention, urinary tract infections, and can lead to kidney damage. Until recently, it was treated with surgery, and this is still an option. However, more recently, they have used microwaves to shrink the prostate or even used needle ablation of the tissue. Prostate cancer is relatively common in older men. About 1 in 6 will develop prostate cancer. However, only 1 in 36 will die of it. It is very common in later life and usually is a very non-aggressive type of cancer. It's found by the digital exam of the rectum and by monitoring prostate-specific antigen. It is now recommended that the PSA no longer be used as a guideline for evaluating prostate cancer. PSA can be influenced by a number of things that are not necessarily prostate cancer. If the PSA is being used as an indicator of prostate cancer, men whose PSA goes up for some other reason may be subject to treatments that are really not necessary.
Most doctors take a watchful waiting with delayed intention to treat approach to prostate cancer. They simply keep an eye on it. As long as it's not growing, as long as the prostate is not giving too many problems, no treatment is given. Surgery and radiation are the typical treatments for prostate cancer. The third accessory gland of the male reproductive system is the bulbourethral glands. These produce a thick, clear mucus that is slightly alkaline. Primarily, it's a lubricant. It is ejected just prior to ejaculation to lubricate the tip of the penis. It also neutralizes any traces of acidic urine that might be in the urethra. Semen is a milky white sticky mixture of sperm and testicular fluid, this comes from the epididymis, and all of the accessory gland secretions. This provides a transport medium for the sperm as well as nutrients. It contains chemicals that protect the sperm and activate it so it swims more strongly. Fructose is present because we have to fuel the motility of the sperm. Some of the chemicals help suppress the female immune system and buffer the acidity of the vagina. Two to five milliliters of semen are reduced with every ejaculation, and there are 20 to 150 million sperm per milliliter of semen. As we look at the male sexual response, there are two major events, erection and ejaculation. Now, while these are the two major events, there's a lot of other things that go on that are part of these two events. Erection is the enlargement and stiffening of the penis. The erectile bodies, the corpora, become engorged with blood. Sexual arousal triggers the parasympathetic system to have a reflex that promotes the release of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide relaxes smooth muscle in the area. That means the arterioles dilate and the blood floods into the penis. As the corpora fill with blood, they compress the veins that drain that blood, so the blood doesn't drain out and the penis remains stiff. Ejaculation is the propulsion of semen from the male duct system. This part is under sympathetic control. Impulses that provoke erection reach a critical level. This sets off spinal reflexes, and there's a massive discharge of nerve impulses from the sympathetic system to the genitals. The bladder sphincter muscle contracts. This keeps urine from leaking out. The reproductive ducts and accessory glands contract, forcing contents into the urethra. Semen in the urethra then triggers a spinal reflex of somatic motor neurons. The penile muscles contract and eject the semen from the penis. Climax or orgasm is followed by the resolution period. Here there is a muscular and psychological relaxation. There is then a latent or refractory period that lasts from minutes to hours. During the latent or refractory period, the male is unable to achieve another orgasm. Erectile dysfunction is an inability to attain or maintain an erection. The parasympathetic nerves do not release enough nitric oxide. About 50% of males over age 40 have erectile dysfunction to some degree. Psychological factors, alcohol, and certain drugs can also cause temporary erectile dysfunction. Chronic ED is largely a problem with hormones. People with diabetes, for example, have problems with ED. Blood vessels, like atherosclerosis, or nervous system problems, stroke or penile nerve damage. Erectile dysfunction remedies included in the old days things like vacuum pumps that would help suck blood into the penis or penile implants that could be pumped up whenever an erection was desired. Today we have Viagra or similar drugs. These drugs act to potentiate the effects of the existing nitric oxide. Spermatogenesis is the production of sperm or spermatozoa. This begins at puberty and in males continues throughout life. The sperm contributes half of the genetic material to any new individual. That is, half of the chromosomes of the new individual come from the father and are carried in the sperm. Somatic cells contain 23 pair of chromosomes, 46 total chromosomes. This is said to be the diploid state. These chromosomes are paired. Paired chromosomes carry genes for the same trait. They are said to be homologous chromosomes. If we're going to make a new individual, we need to reduce the number of chromosomes in the sperm and also in the egg. We need one chromosome from each pair. We need to make a haploid cell. So we use reduction division or meiosis to produce sperm. 
Let's take a minute to look at the difference between meiosis and meiosis. In mitosis, you start with one diploid cell, it divides, and you get two new diploid cells. The new cells are identical to each other and identical to the original. This kind of cell division is used for growth and repair of body tissues. It's a one-step process. The chromosomes replicate and one of each copy goes into the new cell. In meiosis, one diploid cell divides and we get four haploid cells at the end of the process. This is the process that's used to make gametes or used in gametogenesis. This is a two-step process. We still replicate the chromosomes, but first we separate the homologous chromosomes in one cell division, and then we separate the duplicates in the second cell division. Here we see a mother cell before replication. Now there are two green and two purple chromosomes. Two are long, one of the green and one of the purple are long, and one of the green and one of the purple are shorter. In mitosis, we replicate each chromosome, they're held together by a centromere. We line the replicated chromosomes up on the equator of the cell in metaphase. We separate the centromeres and we pull each duplicated chromosome to opposite sides of the cell and the cell divides. We end up with two new cells, each with a long green, long purple, short green, short purple, just like the mother cell. In meiosis, we still replicate the chromosomes, so we still have replicated chromosomes held together by centromeres. But the first thing we do is we put the homologous chromosomes together, that is the chromosomes that are carrying genes for the same trait. We line the homologous chromosomes up on the equator during the first metaphase and we separate them. These chromosomes are still copied, so we still have two copies of each chromosome. In the second phase of meiosis, we line up the replicated chromosomes on the equator and we divide the centromeres. We end up now with four cells. Each has one long and one short chromosome. So we have half the number of chromosomes that we had in the original mother cell. Spermatogenesis occurs in the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules have several layers of cells. The outermost layer, the layer closest to the tube, are known as the spermatogonia. These are the germ cells for the sperm. These cells undergo mitosis to develop a stem cell population. Then at puberty, spermatogenesis begins. This time, out of each mitotic cell division, we get a type A daughter cell and a type B daughter cell. The type A cell remains behind as a spermatogonia, so we never deplete the population of germ cells. The type B cell is pushed toward the lumen, and as it moves toward the lumen, it undergoes meiosis. It becomes first a primary spermatocyte. When that primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis one, it's known as a secondary spermatocyte. That undergoes meiosis two, and we have four spermatids four haploid cells from the original diploid spermatogonia. The spermatids are haploid cells, so we have successfully reduced the chromosome number, but now these spermatids have to undergo spermiogenesis. We have to strip away the cytoplasm and most of the organelles. We develop an acrosome that adheres to the nucleus to protect it on its trip. The nucleus compacts the DNA into the smallest possible package. The mitochondria are concentrated in a section of the spermatozoa known as the midpiece, and a tail develops, a flagellum. So if we look at spermatogenesis, here we have the spermatogonia. That type B cell goes through meiosis. We get the two cells, and then we have the four spermatids. And the four spermatids undergo spermiogenesis to give us the four spermatozoa. The process of spermiogenesis takes approximately 24 days. We develop the acrosome, a little crash helmet if you will. We strip away the cytoplasm. The mitochondria are concentrated into this midpiece. The nucleus condenses down to the smallest package possible and we grow the flagellum. So at the end of 24 days, we basically have a nucleus with a motor and a tail and a little protective bit of headgear. 
there are some specialized cells in the cell population of the seminiferous tubule. These are cells that do not become spermatozoa. They are known as the sustenticular cells or the sustenocytes. All of the spermatogonia from the same cell tend to remain closely associated with each other. The sustenticular cells or the Sertoli cells are the supporting cells that surround the spermatogonia. They have tight junctions between them so that they form a blood testis barrier. This prevents cell antigens from entering the blood and stimulating the immune system. The testes were not active at the time that the immune system was being educated. Therefore, these cells would have antigens on them that the immune system had never seen. They would act as non-self cells to the person's immune system. The sustenticular cells also provide nutrients and chemical signals to the spermatogonia to help tell them when they need to divide. They move the cells into the lumen. They help secrete the testicular fluid and they phagocytize any faulty spermatogenic cells and any of the sloughed cytoplasm that's a byproduct of spermiogenesis. One in seven couples seek treatment for infertility. Most problems have to do with sperm quality or quantity. Over the last 50 years, there has been a gradual decline in male fertility. There are several possible causes. One is that there are more foreign chemicals in the environment, these environmental toxins, things like polyvinyl chlorides and phthalates, things that are in pesticides and herbicides. As a result of more exposure, we think this may have reduced male fertility. Some of these chemicals have estrogenic effects, that is, they block the male hormones. We know that we have estrogen-containing chemicals in meat, also in air. Antibiotics like tetracycline may suppress sperm formation. Since tetracycline is usually taken only for a brief period of time, this should only be a short-term problem. Radiation, lead, marijuana, excessive alcohol, all of these things cause the production of abnormal sperm. Sperm with two heads, sperm with multiple tails. These are not going to be modal. They're not going to be able to penetrate an egg. In some cases, men have a genetic disorder where there's the absence of a specific calcium channel. This does not allow the sperm to undergo meiosis and be released from the testes appropriately. Hormonal imbalances and oxidative stress can also play a role, as well as thermal-related events. Fever, hot tub overuse, even wearing pants that are too tight can push the scrotum up into the body cavity more, causing the testes to be unable to produce viable sperm. Some of these can be treated, some of these cannot be treated. The male reproductive system is under hormonal regulation. It starts in the hypothalamus with the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH. This hormone stimulates the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then releases follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. These two hormones stimulate the cells in the testes. In the testes, FSH stimulates spermatogenesis by stimulating those cystinocytes to release androgen-binding protein. Antigen-binding protein helps keep the concentration of testosterone in the vicinity relatively high. Testosterone is necessary to stimulate spermatogenesis. Luteinizing hormone binds to the interstitial cells and stimulates the secretion of testosterone. So you see we need both FSH and LH in order for spermatogenesis to occur. Testosterone stimulates spermatogenesis. It also circulates in the blood and helps mature and maintain the reproductive system and maintains the secondary sex characteristics. Testosterone additionally feeds back to the pituitary to inhibit gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This helps keep the balance of testosterone pretty steady in the male. The sustenticular cells also release a hormone known as inhibin. An inhibin feeds back to the pituitary to inhibit the release of FSH and LH. The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which has its influence on the anterior pituitary, causing the release of FSH and LH. LH is necessary for testosterone to be produced. FSH stimulates this androgen-binding protein, which helps call testosterone to the area. Testosterone and FSH then act to stimulate spermatogenesis so that we get sperm production. Testosterone also feeds back 
as does the hormone in Hibben, to stop the production of FSH and LH. By doing this, we maintain a very constant level of testosterone in the male. At puberty, testosterone peaks and remains relatively stable throughout life. As we've seen, testosterone prompts spermatogenesis, but it also has general anabolic effects throughout the body. Initially, it stimulates the male reproductive system to grow, but it also is responsible for the male growth spurt. Testosterone also causes the development of the male's secondary sex characteristics. These develop at puberty when testosterone begins to be developed. These characteristics are things like axillary, pubic, and facial hair, as well as hair on the chest and the legs. The larynx enlarges and the voice deepens. The skin thickens and the oil glands produce more oil. This sometimes leads to acne. Muscles and bones go through a tremendous amount of growth as we see that growth spurt. Testosterone is believed to boost the male libido. In utero, testosterone is what masculinizes the brain, and its effects continue after birth. There are differences in the male and female brain and how it operates, and it's believed that testosterone contributes to the masculinization of the brain.